Okay, uh, the first talk uh, for today is by John McMaster. He specializes in microcontroller data extraction using lasers, microscopes, and power analysis. In short, I always introduce him as a hidden gem in the hardware space. Today, John is going to talk to us about taming hydrofluoric acid to extract firmware. Uh, there was a comment last time when he spoke uh, that we hope John didn't burn his fingers because he plays a lot of it chemicals. But nevertheless, uh, if you have any questions to John, please send them across via the Zoom chat, either directly to him or you can send it in the chat and we will take it after John finishes his presentation. So let's welcome John to begin the conference. John, over to you. You are on mute. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Great. Good morning, John, by the way. Good morning, and thank you for that warm introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes, definitely. Great. I think with that, then, I am going to kick it off. Welcome to Hardware I.O. My name is John McMaster, and today I'm going to be talking about taming hydrofluoric acid to extract firmware. First of all, what is firmware? Firmware in the embedded world is any sort of data that you might find in an embedded system. A lot of times it may refer to code. I would say that's the most common, but it also just could be bulk data. Maybe you have a greeting card and there's some sort of audio file that kind of sings to you when you open the card. There's a lot of ways that you could program this onto an embedded system, maybe flash memory, EEPROM, or something like that. But if you have a very high volume application, you want the absolute lowest cost, or maybe you're just very resource constrained in your application, you might actually hard code the bits onto the chip itself. You know, just like you have the CPU design on the silicon die, you also just physically wire the bits onto the die. And if you do this physical wiring, they call that a mask ROM because the masks are the thing that are used to actually fabricate the semiconductor and the bits are actually in the mask of the semiconductor design. The main reason why you do this, I would say typically is low cost, but the biggest issue is if you make a mistake, you know, you're done, like it's in the chip. So very inflexible, but low cost, also very fast. Okay, with that in mind, why am I interested in this data? A lot of reasons why you might do this. I would say the most common that I see commercially is you've got some sort of secure system and you wanna know, hey, this chip has a bootloader that runs before any of the other code runs. Can I trust that bootloader? Maybe it's doing a trusted boot. It's supposed to go to my next stage of code. Maybe they have an error in their signature check algorithm and I wanna know about that. So you might extract this boot ROM to see what is the first initial code running on a microcontroller. Another common use case I would say is you have old hardware, the manufacturer doesn't support anymore. You can't get replacement parts. What do you do when it breaks? A great example is someone emailed me a while back about a very large lathe that they have, something similar to that piece of equipment in my slide. And the issue was they had this power supply that was faulty. It was killing these very rare controller chips they needed to keep it running. And so they were talking to me about, hey, can you extract some firmware from this chip so that we can keep our very expensive machine running? And the last use case that I would see, I would say that I see a lot is someone remembers fondly some piece of hardware from their youth. You know, maybe it was an old Commodore computer or a game console that they grew up with. And now, you know, they want to learn a little bit more about it. So they'll look back and try to study it to learn, oh, you know, that's why this system had that quirk or something like that, that they've just always wanted to know about this system. Now, there's a lot of ways you can get firmware out of the system. And I would say that by and large, if there's some sort of test interface on this chip, you should try to use that first. You know, if it's got JTAG or some sort of proprietary interface, you should really try to electronically dump the firmware if at all possible. Maybe there's some other alternatives, like maybe it has an EEPROM that has some code execution, and maybe it doesn't have the code you're looking for, but if you got execution on that EEPROM, you could then use that to dump the main firmware on the chip. You should try to find these sort of workarounds. And maybe if it doesn't allow code execution directly, maybe you could glitch it to try to get some code execution anyway. But if you've looked at all of this and that's still not working and you really want the data out, this talk is about when all of that fails. So the first thing is if you want to actually get to the low level bits, you need to actually decap a chip and uh, you know, look at the lowest layers of this chip. So the actual physical semiconductor, 
So remove all the epoxy on the package, and typically that's with either nitric or sulfuric acid. And uh, that gives you a bare dye, something like this here. And if you're lucky, maybe it's so-called contact ROM, you may be able to actually directly image the bits on the microscope. But a lot of mask ROMs that you'll see these days are so-called implant mask ROMs. And even if you get down to kind of the lowest layers of the chip, you still aren't going to see the actual bits, similar to this uh, picture here, where there's a little bit of dirt on there, but the actual bits aren't visible. And you need to do something special to actually see the doping on the chip. And uh, one way that you can do that is you can use a process called staining, where stain is basically a special chemical solution to reveal the bits on the chip. And the most common of these is something called dash etch, where dash etch is a mix of nitric acid, uh, acetic acid, and hydrofluoric acid. Now, hydrofluoric acid especially is a very exciting chemical. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this process is very sensitive. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And we're going to gloss over that a little bit in this talk because the focus of this talk will be kind of a novel approach to do this processing and less so on the, the process itself. But you can see here, for example, the same chip that was etched in two different ways with only very slight differences. And the one on the right is very readable, whereas the one on the left is over etched and it's a little bit hard to read the bits. One of the reasons why this happens, for example, is because uh, the etching process itself can be light dependent and all these other factors like you might have uh, metal, I think maybe I, yeah, you might have metal here, for example. Uh, if you have metal on a chip, which is very common, you know, the electrical layers are made of metal, they're going to actually create an oxidizer that's going to start prematurely etching some of the doping and it'll actually destroy the data if you're not careful. And there's a lot of ways that you can work around this. One of the ways is you can mechanically polish off the layers instead of chemically removing them. You can use higher concentration acids. One of the problems with this though is that say a 2% hydrofluoric acid solution, as you might find as a common cleaning agent like Wink, is relatively safe to use. But if you start using say 20%, which doesn't corrode metal as quickly, especially relative to the speed that it etches the, um, the layers that you're trying to remove, uh, but 20% is actually rather hazardous to people. So you start also making this trade off of what works well for your application versus what is safe to use as the person doing that process. You also can do some things like maybe some acid to try to strip out some metal more aggressively. But the easiest workaround is just to change an acid solution more regularly. Because as the metal starts floating off from the chip as you're etching it, what's gonna happen is it's gonna float around and if it sits in that acid too long, it's gonna start getting eaten even though it's no longer contributing to removing layers from a chip. So what can we do about this? Uh, this is a lot of work and I've talked about, you know, you have to do all these solution changes. You've got all these different chemicals we're using, different combination of acids. One solution might be, you know, hire some interns, you know, minions, you know, they're, they're kind of expendable, but you know, they're so unreliable these days and you just can't really trust them. It's not repeatable. We need some sort of automation. What we need is a robot. And I thought about, you know, what are some ways I could actually integrate a robot into this sort of process? Currently, the way I would do this is a lot of pipettes, you know, you kind of squeeze little bulbs and move chemicals around. But uh, so yeah, maybe I could just build a pipetting robot. Maybe if I had a robot arm, I could move some chemicals around. Uh, I could change the acid automatically. And one of the fundamental problems is a lot of the stuff I can do by hand, but it's not as repeatable. Some of these processes like the dash etch uh, step, for example, you want to be on the order of a 10 second etch time for that. It's very, very quick. And you know, if you go to 12 seconds even, it can substantially affect the results if you have a specific process you're trying to tune for. So really want some sort of automation. The biggest problem though with all this, I would say, is a lot of projects I just don't do because I don't want to do this process where I'm changing acid solutions for a few hours to prepare a chip and then doing this very uh, stressful etch process at the end to reveal the bits. So, if I had some way to automate things, it would really help a lot of the projects I'm trying to do. So maybe not a robot arm, but maybe if we had something that just had kind of a series of valves that could control chemical flow, and then some sort of controller that could sequence those valves, I could probably make something that could kind of squirt chemicals into a chamber in the right proportions at the right time. And if I did that in such a way that the chemicals mixed in the right ways at the right time, I should be able to automate this process without some sort of fancy robot arm. And ideally, I would like to do this as quickly as possible, 
that is, I don't need to build something low cost. You know, this is something that is a specialized piece of equipment and it's worth it to just kind of throw money at it because I'm not going to make that many of these and just design it quickly. At the same time though, I also don't want to make custom parts. You know, for example, I don't want to have to manufacture my own, you know, manifold. You know, it should be off the shelf parts that I can just kind of snap together like Legos. With that in mind, this is kind of the high level idea of what I was thinking. We need basically three solution tanks. So we need water, which allows us to clean this, the system. We need hydrofluoric acid, which allows us to do some initial etching to get down to the lower semiconductor layers. And then finally, we need dash etch, which will allow us to essentially develop the bits into uh, the, uh, the substrate into visible bits. And then we also have this etch cell where the chemicals mix and, and the chip is in there. We also have this halogen light. I mentioned that there was kind of a light sensitive chemical reaction in the, in the dash etch. So that allows us to give us the option of activating that light sensitivity if we so want. And then finally, we need a waste tank to store the acid after it's used so we could cycle through these chemicals and automatically put the next one in. And this was uh, kind of the first idea. One thing I found though, is as I tried to do this, that sometimes uh, some of the solution in the etch cell, even though it had a very small output opening, would actually slosh out into the waste tank. So the very first thing I said was, oh, I need another valve. Oh, and these, if you're not familiar, those little hourglass symbols are uh, as a schematic symbol for a valve, basically. All electronically controlled in this case. And uh, yeah, so I added a valve and said, okay, nothing is gonna slosh out during etching, let's add something there. The next problem that I encountered was I was a little bit afraid of chemical contamination. You know, we have these T-junctions here. Say, for example, the T-junction for the dash etch, you know, right below the valve on dash. I was afraid that there might be some solution, some old dash etch that would kind of be in the line there from a previous etch operation. And as I started putting hydrofluoric acid in for the next etch, it would kind of slosh around, grab some of that dash etch, and prematurely etch the chip in a way that I didn't want it to. So to solve this problem, I then added basically some blowback valves. And the idea is that after doing, say, a dash etch, where I dispense some chemicals through the dash valve on the left, I then blow air through the system to purge it. And that means that now that there's an, a literal air gap between the dash tank and the feed line below. And this allows me to say, every time that I do one of the dispenses, I know all of the chemicals in the, uh, the, the system have been accurately dispensed and there's not going to be any contamination from a future etch step to a past etch step. And with that in mind, this is roughly speaking what our system is going to look like. And then I'll go into some of these components in a little more detail to show you what they look like. First thing that I was a little bit concerned about is I need some way to accurately, relatively accurately dispense the, the solutions. And you can find these, you know, metering pumps and all this sort of stuff that'll do that for you. You know, that is dispense one milliliter of solution. But I had very caustic solutions that weren't necessarily going to work well. And, uh, you know, I also don't have super accurate requirements. I just need, hey, give me around one milliliter, maybe 0.8, maybe 1.2 milliliters. But as long as it's roughly in that range, it's actually fine for my application. Because I'm not really precisely mixing things. I just needed to, to cover the dye. I thought about maybe I could pressurize the lines, but I was, was afraid that maybe, even though that could be very accurate with pressurized uh, pressure regulators, maybe something would burst, it would explode, you know, shoot acid everywhere. And, you know, uh, geez, 20% hydrofluoric acid shooting everywhere just kind of scared me. So I was a little bit concerned about pressurizing anything. Another option would be just to gravity feed the system. If I had the tanks relatively high and, you know, had a good line distance where you know, even if the tank drained a little bit, the pressure remained relatively constant. That would mean that I didn't need a, another pump to drive that. And it would be a very low pressure that was fairly consistent. And yeah, so I decided to go with gravity feed, but because of that, I need to control kind of a constant pressure. And I decided to use flow restrictors to control the flow rate in that case. And a flow restrictor basically looks like this assembly that you see on the right there. What I've done is basically just nest a series of tubes together to make a very small orifice that uh, fluid can go through. And that was kind of just a guess and check thing where I tried a few different tube sizes to find a flow rate that I was happy with. I think I shot for something in the one to two milliliters per second. And uh, yeah, then I calibrated it to find what the flow rate was. And then those calibrations then went into a Python script that just knew, oh, you've got one milliliter per second flow. 
I need a two milliliters. So, you know, turn on a valve for two seconds. And that allowed me to fill up the chamber to the levels that I needed to. I did want to test this though, because I wasn't quite clear if this was going to work reliably. So I took a few reverse osmosis parts, you know, like you'd use for filtering drinking water and just made a quick and dirty test system that you see there to the right. Uh, instead of using 20% hydrofluoric acid, you know, right out of the bat, I just used some dyes with waters because roughly speaking, the fluid dynamics, I think between water and you know, some of these chemicals are gonna be pretty similar. So at least it makes a good first order pass. And this was great because it did verify that the, uh, this way of metering the flow worked. It was reasonably accurate or certainly accurate enough for my application. So that's good. Okay, now what else do we need? We also need an etch chamber, you know, something to, to hold the sample. I had a little bit of trouble finding something that had, you know, nice ports on it to get fluid in and out. There are a few commercial solutions for etching wafers and stuff like that, but they looked really expensive. So I didn't really want to buy anything like that. Ultimately, what I decided, this is one of the few parts I had to really modify something and do some machining, was I took a reverse osmosis valve and I milled out the center, kind of like you're seeing there after taking the valve apart and basically just kind of shored up the bottom so that I had an etch chamber that was in line with the ports on the side. Because uh, one of the issues was it actually dips down a lot lower than where the fluid comes in from the side. And in order for it to drain nicely, I wanted the inlet and the outlet to be level with the bottom of the chamber. I did that by filling some wax in after milling out some of the, uh, the valve components that you see never removed there. And after doing that, I got something that was relatively nice and suited my needs. I wasn't super happy about adding the wax in there because I was a little bit afraid that it might uh, react with some of the chemicals. And, uh, but you know, you work with what you got. So at this point, I decided that, you know, it was good to try something. I had a way to dispense some chemicals. I had an etch chamber. It was time to try something. 2% HF, you know, roughly speaking, you find in Wink is something that will work to de-layer a chip, you know, and get the layers off. It's a lot slower than say 20% hydrofluoric acid, but it's also a lot gentler on the system. I was using a lot of these reverse osmosis uh, components, which really aren't intended for super corrosive solutions. And I thought this would be a good first test to get an application going with a, chip, uh, with a system and not be too brutal on it. And it seemed to work good. I was able to dispense the chemicals, the valves didn't explode, the lines were fine, no leaks, great. Unfortunately though, I really want this 20% hydrofluoric acid. It gives a faster result, it gives a higher quality result. Let's give that a try and see what happens. And I knew that maybe some things would fail over time, but oh boy, did they fail quickly. <laughs> and the first one is probably my favorite. Uh, when most people have a lab accident, I think their first instinct is, you know, hit the e-stop button, you know, maybe, uh, you know, scream for help, you know, shut everything down. My first, first instinct was, man, this, this just looks like something out of a mad scientist lab. I'm going to get a camera and film this. So what happened here is the hydrofluoric acid ate through part of the etch chamber over here. And this is the light because it's kind of this light sensitive reaction and it just started dripping out and it just looks like something out of a mad scientist film or something this glowing chamber with toxic chemicals leaking out. Okay, so not great. We're gonna have to address this, but it makes kind of a funny video. Oh, and this is the drain valve you see to the right with the chamber on the left. And these are the chemicals getting fed in over here. All right, uh, fortunately it turns out that I actually had some of these semiconductor grade valves. So instead of using reverse osmosis, which was this relatively low grade plastic, I have these semiconductor grade valves, which are extremely chemically resistant, designed for high purity applications. And frankly, they're just designed to hold things like hydrofluoric acid, because that's what they use on the wafer fabrication facilities. And just by chance, this particular model that I chose also happened to have the ports for the inlet and outlet of this valve body also happened to be on the bottom of the surface. So I didn't have to do any machining on this or, or very light. I think I smoothed out some of the edges. Um, but yeah, I didn't have to add any fill material. And the one thing that I did do was, you can't really see in this picture, is there was an inlet and an outlet on that valve. I kind of melted, you know, plastic welded one of the ports shut to make the whole thing seal very well. But overall, this was a great upgrade and just completely eliminated any problems that I had with the chamber leaking. So pretty happy with that. But as we go on, other things started failing too. Fortunately, this was one of those flow restrictors. So it actually happened to have a uh, Teflon outer tubing that was very chemically resistant. So there was no spillage for this. 
but polyurethane also got pretty rapidly corroded by this 20% hydrofluoric acid solution. But that was fortunately a very easy fix. I, uh, in case it's not obvious, that was supposed to be blue. It started out blue and now you see it's kind of crumbling apart. All I had to do though was just replace these with, um, you know, chemical resistant tubing that's very readily available. Easy fix, not a problem. The last thing though that was a bit of a problem was the reverse osmosis valves that I was using just to do the chemical flow. Those actually degraded a lot quicker than I was expecting. For example, that drain valve, which is what you're seeing here, actually broke within just a few minutes of me using it. And this surprised me. Like I knew this was gonna be tough on it, but I didn't expect it to fail so quickly. And I think what happened was that uh, there's kind of this metal casing of the valve and it didn't actually eat the, the seals, which I thought was the original problem. What you can actually see there are some metal flakes that have embedded themselves in the valve seat, the rubber there. And I think what happened was the hydrofluoric acid ate the valve body and that started flaking off and landing on the valve seat. And that basically jammed the valve open and that made it so they started leaking chemicals uh, from the etch chamber into the waste tank. And that was problematic and really indicated that things were gonna fail a lot quicker than I thought it to. So this needed to be addressed a lot sooner than I thought I was going to. Unfortunately, while you can get full-sized uh, chemical resistant valves, typically made of Teflon, you know, PTFE, relatively inexpensively, let's call it, you know, $250 each, although that's still quite expensive because I need, you know, two or three of these for a working system. You know, one for hydrofluoric acid, one for dash etch, and one for the drain valve. The miniature chemical resistant valves are even more expensive. I think I was seeing about $800 each, and unfortunately, that was kind of the size I needed. I was a little bit put off by this, and I started thinking, what could I do to optimize this cost a little bit? And my first reaction was, hey, you know, I saw some papers from the nuclear industry. They deal a lot with, you know, hydrofluoric acid, you know, uranium hexafluoride, all these really nasty fluorine compounds. And they had some papers about gold coating some conventional solenoids, you know, like the ones I was using already, to make them more chemical resistant. I thought, okay, that's interesting. I have a lot of gold plating equipment here. And uh, I tried this out, but, you know, gold plating, you know, electroplating, this sort of stuff really is an art form. And I would have needed a little bit more practice to really get something that would work well. And ultimately, I also still have this rubber seat on the uh, solenoid, me, which is not something that's very chemically resistant. So after having some trouble making the high quality coating, uh, concerns about how long this rubber was going to last on there, I decided to abandon this entirely when I realized that after a little bit more hard digging on eBay, I was actually able to find some surplus miniature chemical valves for not too much money, you know, something like 5% of what I was seeing for them new. And at that point, I was happy to just buy a few of those and move on. All right, so here's a picture of one of them here. So on the left, you can see this chemical resistant valve. That white is the Teflon housing next to the black, which is just the, the solenoid driving the valve. And to the right of that, you can see one of these conventional reverse osmosis valves, which is not chemical resistant. So basically, I'm using the reverse osmosis valves to purge the air out of the system and the chemical resistant valves to actually hold the chemicals themselves that, that do need to be corrosion resistant. The other bit you can maybe see a little bit is there's a little gray insert, which goes from the valve to the tubing that has the flow restrictor next to it. That bit is a uh, Kynar, which is a PVDF. And that's pretty chemically resistant. I seem to have no problems with it so far. Uh, so essentially we have Teflon, PVDF, and I think some of the tubing is made of ETFE or something like that. All of those are pretty high grade plastics. And so far they seem to be holding up pretty well. One of the things though I also found is I had a lot of reverse osmosis miscellaneous components still in the system. And what I've done here is I have put a little bit of nitric acid on each one of these solenoids. And you can see the one on the left, the body starts reacting violently. Acid was put on all three of these at the same time. And what this indicates is that that body on the left has a high degree of this chemical known as POM. It's like, uh, like acetyl, I don't remember what POM stands for. The point is this chemical has very, very weak chemical resistance. And as I start using these very aggressive chemicals, I was concerned that any components having POM in them were gonna react very violently in the system. And in fact, that early chamber failure, I believe now is due to the POM getting rapidly eaten with the hydrofluoric acid. 
and then leaking out. So we need to do two things. We need to first screen components in the system to find out if they contain POM. And second of all, we need to replace those components. And after a little bit of testing, I found out that POM was basically everywhere. Even components that weren't labeled as POM, uh, they were actually falsely labeled. They, a lot of them contained POM, either just solid POM or as an alloy. A uh, good example is that those tanks on the right are what I use for the solution feed tanks. And the one on the left, you can see where it's got a little P, that's because I tested those are POM fittings. Fortunately on the right though, I was able to find PVDF, that is Kynar, this very high grade plastic or relatively high grade. And I was able to replace those in a lot of areas where it was critical and this transition was fairly smooth. I also used a lot fewer quick disconnect uh, connectors in this transition. The thing on the left, for example, was originally constructed with reverse osmosis, you know, Y connectors with dis quick disconnects. But in the final configuration, I tried to eliminate as many quick disconnects as possible. You still see one at the bottom. I might eliminate that in a future uh, design, but that's PVDF that's very chemical resistant. And it turns out that a lot of these PVDF uh, fittings get used in the hot beverage industry. So maybe if you have like a hot coffee machine or something like that, they will use these high quality plastics in those machines. So it wasn't as expensive to get these fittings as I initially thought it was going to be. And I was still not cheap. Like there's a lot more than, um, you know, uh, reverse osmosis, osmosis fittings, but at a pretty reasonable price. And I was able to retrofit the system. All right. Pretty good. Uh, I've replaced almost everything in the system with very high purity fittings now. You know, high purity, you know, chemical resistant valves and fittings and tubing and all that. Unfortunately, there was still one more problem. I noticed in the dash etch tank, I was getting this black gunk that you see building up in the line there. That's supposed to be basically a clear white translucent color in that middle image. But you see this black is building up in the column there. And on the right, you can see the top of the flow restrictor we're at the very top of the flow restrictor, there's maybe a tube here. You can also see there's this black layer building up. And I also saw these splotches on the chips and you can see even a chunk landed on the one at the left. And it really created these etching defects. And it's really important to get very even etching on these chips. So this was a big problem. I need to figure out what was going on. Fortunately though, I realized that the flow restrictor is very high up in the system. So if something was was settling there, it meant that there wasn't a lot above it to troubleshoot. The tanks looked like they were fine, but one of the most complicated bits of the system are these shutoff valves. That red valve you can see in the middle is very similar to the one that used to be to the right. And I believe what the problem is, the middle of these are a chemical called polysulfone. Sulfone? Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyways, as best I can tell, that was the component being corroded and it would have been good to have an emergency shutoff valve on this chemical tank. But since it was being corroded, I had to remove it from the system. And uh, it's been a little bit since I removed that now. So far, the system seems fine. So I'm pretty confident that that caused the problem. And the reason why in part, I believe it was that specifically is there are a few other chemicals, uh, uh, substances that are used in that valve, but they haven't been corroded in other parts of the system. And as I tried to open and close that valve, Minding you, there's an identical valve to the left of it. I could feel that one was very rough. So it was very clear something had changed in that valve. Anyways, so far seems good. One last thing though, to get a working system, the machine itself is working at this point, but we also need something that will actually hold the chip. I, early on, I just used some very inexpensive plastics. I think I used zip ties, very large ones, which were made of PVC or something like that. Unfortunately, that was getting attacked by the acid. So I switched to, uh, uh, Teflon, basically just sheets of Teflon, and made these little sample holders that fit into the chip thing. The reason why they have that funny little tab you see at the lower right of these is basically so I can grab that with tweezers very easily. And then those are drain holes around the edges to make the uh, chemicals be able to sh suck out as I'm changing the acid in the tank. I also played around with a few different ways to hold down chips. I was a little bit concerned because wax was getting eaten by the acid in some early experiments. I played around with using very chemical resistant greases to hold down chips like Crytox. Ultimately though, that tended to contaminate the chips a little bit. And I eventually just went back to wax, but just putting a very small dab under the chip. And because it was underneath the chip, it tend not to get attacked too much by the chemicals and tend to be a cleaner result. So I think going forward, I'm just gonna use the wax and not using the Crytox too much. All right, so now we've talked about all the components. So let's just kind of review. Here's what the final system looked like. 
On the left, we have the mechanical, which is where I put the most of the work in. And on the right, you have kind of the electrical control system, which admittedly could use a little bit of cleanup, definitely on the to-do list there. But anyway, so at the upper left, we see the chemical feed tanks from left to right. We have water, hydrofluoric acid, and dash etch. Below those, you see uh, three, three pairs of solenoid valves. Each one of those is an air valve, which is distributed with that black manifold above it. And then the actual chemical valve to the left. So the sequencing then, for example, if I wanna fill up the tank with water, is the water chemical valve will activate on the far left. I'll do that for maybe a second or two to fill up the chamber. That valve closes and then the valve to the right of it opens and some pressurized air clears out those lines. And when I do that, I'm able to relatively accurately fill up the chamber with the desired amount of solution. Once I'm done with the solution in the chamber, that valve to the lower right, you know, that little black and a white thing, that opens up and then a vacuum uh, pump above it, which is inside a uh, waste chamber, which you can't see off screen, that basically sucks everything out of the chamber. And because of our dye is basically glued down to a sample holder, it stays in a chamber as we're sucking all the waste solution out. And here's just a quick video to show you what this might look like in operation. This is a Xilinx, which has been uh, etching. You saw those little bubbles, where it's gas being put off from a previous etch step. I'm flowing some water through here to just kind of wash it off. A lot of thought has been put into the specific ways which the chamber is kind of filled and washed. So that was water that rinsed it. This is now fresh acid that's been put into the chamber. If you want to know a little bit more about the details about how I'm sequencing things, we can talk about that in the breakout room. But anyways, there's the machine working. Uh, just a few quick anecdotes about the process. Here is a chip that I etched with it. Uh, this was the very first test. You can see on the left, there was the chip with the metal. The right, you know, all the layers have been removed. Here's an example of a ROM. As I mentioned, one of the primary applications of this was extracting mask ROMs. This was something you previously couldn't see any of the bits. Now you can see the bits as these bright white areas and then the darker areas, you know, like the zeros and maybe the brights are the one. This was an early microchip pick. And uh, I did have some more problems with uh, more modern chips. So this is an IMX6, for example. It has uh, barrier metals, which don't get etched off very easily. I'm considering adding some additional etching tanks to deal with this. But um, other chips, like I tried this Arctic 7, worked pretty well. So it's kind of hit or miss depending on their specific technology. And finally, one of the ways that I would say best to deal with this is to use a lapping machine on these modern chips basically polish off the layers and then do this final staining operation, which absolutely has to be done in this chemical manner to do the final processing. Uh, so a few things to play with there, but uh, so far it seems to be working pretty good, at least for my purposes, especially since I'm mostly interested in older chips right now. Thanks for listening. Anyway, I know that was a lot to take in. Hopefully you have, uh, you know, some interest in this type of machine. If you do, uh, if you're interested in one of these, please reach out. I'm considering building a couple more of them for a few people. Let me know what you would want to actually make use of this in terms of reliability or chemicals. Thanks for listening then, and uh, please reach out if you have any questions. Thanks, John, uh, for this beautiful presentation and uh, videos that you took. There are a few questions uh, in the public chat, but I'm not sure if you've received any in your private chat. Do you want to take first those? I think I see 26 messages. Uh, if oh. you are able to point me some. Okay. Uh, let me, let me. Uh, ignore, okay. There's a question uh, here. How, how, how do you clean it? Maybe I could start there. Yeah. Yeah. Cleaning. Uh, generally speaking for the actual hydrofluoric acid etching step, it comes out relatively clean after decapping. If there is some debris on there, maybe another round of nitric acid to clean off, say, organic residue. If I got some wax on it from uh, setting it onto the sample holder, maybe acetone to take that off. It depends on the specific contamination, but generally speaking, I'll use something like IPA, you know, rubbing alcohol, maybe ultrasound it, and then inspect it under a microscope, especially as I'm preparing to do that final uh, dash step, which is very sensitive. And as long as that's reasonably clean, that final wash step, which happens automatically in the machine, will give me a very clean surface to get a reliable reaction. Uh, there's another question. How, how many chip, hardware chips do you destroy before achieving a perfect result? That's a good question. 
generally speaking, what I've found is two things. I will get practice chips if it's something very rare. So say this pick microcontroller, if that was something that I was like, oh man, we only have one of these very rare. Maybe I would find some sample chips that were very similar. Practice it on those first to make sure the process is right. That said, I've actually processed a fairly large number of chips now of that vintage. And I would say that there are things that I could do to optimize it to get better results. But typically I'm able to get something good enough on the first try, at least for older chips, that one chip is enough. For new, newer chips where I don't quite have the process right yet, I would say maybe three chips-ish, maybe one to kind of tune the process a bit, and then a couple of chips to actually extract the bits on. Having two chips add some redundancy as bit errors are uh, encountered, and that allows me to get a much higher quality result. So let's call it three, something like that. Uh, let's see, any other questions? Oh, intrigued about the TL866. Yes, so as some of you may be aware, I'm just gonna do a short plug. I am the lead for the Open TL866 project, which is an open source device programming uh, firmware. And part of the reason why I have that there is A, I'm just familiar with the code base, but B, there is a Python library that just allows me to bit bang on the pins. So for quick prototyping, I didn't have to write any embedded C code. I just put this microcontroller board over there and just said, you know, turn switch three on. And that was just very quick to set up. Long term, though, there are some safety concerns with that. I really would like atomic operations, you know, turn valve on for, you know, one second so that if the laptop uh, falls asleep, you know, after <laughs> valve open, that the valve just doesn't stay open. Uh, so definitely on the improvement list to move away, away from the TL866 for multiple uh, reasons. But for prototyping, it was definitely uh, a good move. Let's see. Could, <laughs> can we get a promise to use your powers for good and not evil? Well, skipping that question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, too late, Adam says. Uh, it's to neutralize and properly dispose the waste. Ask your local authorities. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, someone mentioned, oh, I saw the uh, POM. Someone had the abbreviation there. Uh, polyoxymethylene, POM. Uh, let's see. Oh, someone asked about peristaltic valves. I assume that's similar to pumps. Uh, yeah, you could do that potentially. A lot of the plastics, though, that are used in this are very rigid. Like an example is a misconception I had was that silicone was relatively chemically resistant. But after doing some research, I found out it's actually not that chemically resistant and really wouldn't work in this application. It would get uh, eaten by the acid very quickly. And I'm not really sure what is something that would be flexible that could be crushed, you know, like an IV pump to actually meter fluid out. I'm open to hear more about that though, if you have some ideas about how that could work on this machine. Uh, Sean, we'll see. take one question and then we'll open for a breakout room if that's okay with you. Sure, yeah. Do you have a question of choice? Uh, let's take the one that says, uh, it worked with newer wafer, but not old. Any insights on that? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, it works with newer wafer, but not old? Work with newer yes. wafer, not old. Any insight on that? Uh, maybe to clarify, if you have a newer chip, uh, it basically has these uh, barriers like titanium nitride and stuff like that, which the machine doesn't uh, handle well currently. So there's two proposed workarounds uh, to handle this. It's either to add more etchant tanks that have solutions like uh, a mix of ammonia and hydrogen peroxide, which can etch these barriers, or to use a lapping machine to mechanically polish to roughly to the substrate of the chip and then do final etching with hydrofluoric acid, you know, after you've removed all these barriers and then do the very final step with the dash etch. So either mechanically polish away these barriers or add additional uh, chemicals to the machine. So those are kind of the two workarounds to do more modern chips. All right, John, uh, before we open the breakout room for everybody, uh, I would just like to share uh, small video that uh, says hi, that's John's friend uh, from the home of hardware.io SF. 
I hope uh, I have enabled my audio. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, let me play this video for you guys. Greetings from the Biltmore Hotel, home of Hardware IOSF. I'm attending Hardware IO because this year they are allowing robots. The humans won't suspect a, oh. suspect a thing, or I mean looking forward to the talks. I see your desktop, not the video. Okay, my bad. I didn't... <laughs> you should have told me that. Well, I, was, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Okay. There we go. Greetings from the Biltmore Hotel, home of Hardware IOSF. I'm attending Hardware IO because this year they are allowing robots. The humans won't suspect a thing or I mean looking forward to the talks. All right. <laughs> I hope, you, hope you enjoy that. I just want to give a quick shout out. Uh, thanks to uh, Natalie Silvanovich for helping me reverse engineer that robot. And maybe at some point, it's actually sitting uh, here. Maybe Hopefully at some point in the future, I'll give a talk on that. Great. Uh, so friends, now we open the breakout room. Uh, please look out for not notification in your Zoom chat.